So here's a question you've probably never asked yourself. Just like you've never asked yourself, why do I always follow noun, adject, put adjectives before the noun instead of after? We, we don't ask ourselves, how does language work? We just do it. And, uh, you know, I, most people couldn't tell you a thing about participles, but everyone knows how to use them. It's just natural. It's instinctive. It's part of the human experience. And we don't think about it because it's, it's part of who we are. Uh, stories are the same way. We don't consider them really. We don't think about them until we step back and examine and say, how does a story actually work? We know what a story is. We watch them. We read them. We tell them all the time. And we know if someone breaks the rules of what a story is, we notice it just as easily as if we notice that someone starts saying garbled gork bars dargaba, total garbage. You know, you knew that was in English <laughs> because you know what English is and you know what it sounds like and what it's not. But what makes a story a story versus what makes it not a story? Let's talk about it. First of all, stories progress through time. Now, some complex stories will play with time as part of their plot. You know, it'll go back in time or jump back and forth or not be linear in some way. But whatever the case, stories always progress from one spot in time forward. Um, even if a story that plays with time will have a linear progression forward, even if... Uh, anyways, it, for our discussion, we're just going to talk about stories move forward in time. You have at the beginning of the story, in the middle, and the end, and everything in between. But a story wouldn't be a story without a problem. There is something that needs to be resolved, and that's what makes a story happen. Without this problem, it's just a documentary about boring things happening and nothing going on. This The problem might be a poor orphan who needs to find a place to, to be. A problem might be a hiker in the Yukon struggling to stay alive. Uh, the problem might be two star-crossed lovers struggling to make their relationship work in spite of all odds, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, there's always a problem. And then the story is just the sequence of steps. Here's an event, and then another event, and then this event, all moving forward until we finally get to the solution to the problem. And this is where the problem is ended. It's over. Now, it could be a happy ending where the problem is resolved and everything works out and it's great. Or it could be a unsolution where the problem is not solved or is forever unresolved. And again, I'll go back to the star-crossed lovers. Uh, Romeo and Juliet is a good example of a the solution is actually a failure to solve the problem. They are in love, but they're, in the end, their circumstances get the better of them, and they're not able to successfully be in a relationship together, and they die. So, there you go. sorry, spoilers. But for our experience, humans, we tend to like happy endings, and so most of our books, movies, and the stories we tell tend to have happy endings and resolutions. The beginning of the story, I, I started with the problem, but just so you know, in a lot of times, we'll have the setup before the story, a little bit of time where we introduce characters and setting and so forth, a little bit of background called the exposition. If you look at the story plotted over time, it's actually a very small amount of the story is devoted to that, just enough to get us what we need, and then we move on. And there's also always a little bit of story at the end after the solution which is called, this is called the Resolution, um, which I feel is an unfortunate name because really the solution is the resolution of the problem, but whatever. They call it the Resolution or the Denouement, if you want to sound all classy in French. Again, in plotted out over time, this is a very short amount of time on a, on an, in an actual plot is devoted to the Resolution or Denouement after the problem has been solved. But they're there and they're part of the story. It's to wrap up the loose ends and give closure so we see where everyone ends up and sometimes to come full circle even. The problem, just so you know, you'll see it in English class and so forth, often talked about as the conflict. 
and a lot of times that's because we think of it as a conflict between the protagonist and some exterior force, whether it be an antagonist, another character, or maybe against nature, or against society, or even against his or her own self, um, if it's an internal conflict. And the solution is often referred to as the climax, uh, and that's because it is generally the point of highest intensity in the story where everything comes to a head. We have to be careful discussing that because while that is a characteristic of the climax, uh, the real thing that defines the climax is the fact that it is ending the conflict. And so then that's why I say it's unfortunate that they called the part after the climax a resolution because really what's resolving the conflict, the climax is, and that's what makes it the climax. So it would be nice if they just called that the solution or resolution and called the ending something else, but whatever. Just for your information, the climax, what defines it, what makes it what it is, is it ends the conflict, it ends the problem. That's what makes a climax a climax. It happens to be the point of highest tension in the story, but that's not the most important thing about it. It's the flip side of the conflict coin. Sorry, I'm kind of going off here because I'm an English major and I see this often taught wrong and, and discussed wrong where people will just say, oh, the climax is just the point of highest tension. Ah, that's not the most important thing. Sorry, I'll move on now. You'll see this, uh, I've got this plot here set out in uh, just a straight line uh, as it progresses over time, but often you'll see it graphed with... Uh, with an X and Y axis where the X axis is time as the story moves forward and the Y axis being the intensity. And so the, the line doesn't stay flat. And what you'll see is that the line goes up and down as the intensity rises. In fact, those uh, black bars I've got in the middle, the events between the conflict and the climax are often called the rising action because the intensity increases over time as you're getting through the story. And most of any story is devoted to that spot, that, that section, the rising action, the area between the conflict and the climax. Really, if this were accurate, I would stretch this graph out and make that line even longer because you really get a good three quarters of the space of a story at least is going to be rising action. Uh, longer than that, if it's, a, if it's like a movie or something or a novel, you'll have quite small portions for the exposition at the beginning, the resolution and denouement at the end and much more for the conflict, the climax, and all the rising action in between. All right, I'm going to go over this with you using a well-known story to demonstrate how a plot plotted with intensity over time looks like. You'll probably recognize this plot diagram shape as we go through it. And I'm going to use some of my favorite rambunctious storytellers to help me tell it. Here we go. Watch how the plot line plays out as it progresses over time and increases or decreases in intensity. Right. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. That's right. One built his house out of? Straw. 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 One built his house out of? Sticks. Yeah, and one built his house out of? Bricks. That's right. Now, up till now, this is a real boring look at the plot line so far. As time passes, the intensity is flatlining. This is not very intense. It's not very interesting. If this were all our story was, it'd be super boring. Lucky for us, along came the big bad wolf. And he was hungry to eat pig. That's right. Now, this is our conflict. We now have a problem. That's going to make a story happen. Without it, everyone of the pigs would have just walked around and washed dishes and planted gardens and stuff. But now we've got some action. We've got conflict, a problem. Pig want, the wolf wants to eat the pigs. Pigs probably don't want to get eaten. Well, he went to... Where did he go? Straw house. Yeah, the straw house. And he said... Little pig, little pig. Now you can't eat me. That's right. That is increasing... Our intensity and so now we see as time progresses in the story now the intensity is going up things are getting more interesting now yeah He's threatening our first pig yeah my and, day yeah that's right now what did the little pig say he said not my I have a penny tin tin and then the wolf said when I have blow your house down that's right and that's just what he did he blew the house down and 
the story gets even more intense as time progresses. Well, that little pig, where did he run to? He ran to... The brick stick. Yeah, the stick house. So he ran there, and along comes... The big bad wolf. That's right, and he said... Little pig, little pig, let me come in. And the little pig said... Not by the heck. And the story gets even more intense. Now there's two pigs under threat. And the wolf said... Oh, and he did just that. And those two little pigs, they ran away. Where did they run to? Their brother's house. In the house of... That's right. And now we've got all three pigs under threat from this wolf, and it's getting more and more intense as the story continues. Yeah. The wolf comes up to the house of... And he says... Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Let me come in. And it gets even more intense. He's right at their door now. What, is, what do the little pigs say? Not my heart on my chinny chinny and then the wolf says, Huff. And he huffs and puffs and blows, but does he blow their house down? No. no, it doesn't get blown down. And so the wolf says, well then, I'm going to climb up on the chimney. That's right. Ooh, it's getting real intense now as he climbs up onto the roof and to the chimney. And he's going to jump in so he can eat up those pigs, all three of them now. Now we're at the most intense part of the story, and this is where we get to the climax. What's it say? Oh, it says climax. That's the most intense part of the story, and this is where the point where the story gets resolved. Because what do the pigs do when he tries to climb in? Get a pot put water in and fire. They'll get a pot and put water in it and fire, and they cook him in a soup. And this is the end of the story, be not just because it's the most intense part, but because it ends the conflict. Yeah. The pigs no longer have to worry about the wolf trying to eat them. So, our story is over. What do you think of going in a sea? Oh, I don't know if I would like it. Would you? Mm, yeah. No. I prefer to eat soup than be in it, huh? Mm -hmm. Now, you may be asking, what about the very end of the story? Well, there is a wrap-up, but... It was the <laughs> oh, oh, very nice. Now, the line, the intensity line goes way down because now the problem is over. The conflict is resolved in the climax. And so now just um, the story ends. We have wrap up, and but it's a lot less intense now. And it might be something like they sang and danced at a piano made of bricks and they lived happily ever after. And that's how stories end. That's, that's a plot diagram. Thank you, little miss. That's a good example for you. And I better end before my little helpers take over completely. There you go. And there you have it. That's a plot diagram, and those are the elements of a story. Again, I'm sorry if you're saying, Mr. Cox, you're giving short shrift to the exposition and to the resolution slash Dana Mong at the end. I am, because they are small, granted important, but small parts of the plot. Uh, most of the time is spent, as you can see, in the, in the rising action. <clears throat> Make sure that you, as you prepare your story, that you're giving a lot of attention to the conflict and to the climax, and then, of course, that you're paying attention to building the intensity as you move from one to the other. And then after that, you can say, all right, now what do I need to set up in the exposition to make sure this is all making sense? And how am I going to wrap things up and give closure at the end? And it, again, those parts of the story take a relatively small amount of time.